So on the show today, Eric Franklin, founder of the Franklin Method, sort of expert body worker, experiential anatomy. I mean, hard to describe. I think Eric will take us through what the Franklin Method is, but he's well known, well loved. Uh, it was at the Embodiment Conference and he's on the show today. So Eric, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, great to be here. Yeah, I should sort of say the context a little bit. I'm a sitting in a room full of medicines going to the Ukraine tomorrow. I'm currently um, to Ukraine tomorrow. I'm currently in, in Krakow and you're in Zurich, right? I, I'm in Zurich and, and we also uh, we also have been supporting, uh, you know, the refugees. We have uh, on our staff, a Ukrainian, and he's up there with lots of things to help at the border. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll come back to that. But for now, let's start with your life. How did you get interested in the body and anatomy, Eric? What was the beginning of <laughs> The simple answer is problems. <laughs> no, I was a dancer. I was a dancer in New York, and um, you know, I went to NYU School of the Arts. And I, you know, after that training, I, everything hurt. My knees hurt. My back hurt. My, uh, you know, my feet hurt. <laughs> and I was thinking, okay, mm -hmm. dance must be really bad for you. You know, if it does this to you. And then, you know, after a lot of thinking and research, of course, it's not dancing itself that isn't good for you it's actually very good very healthy on many levels but you know you have to know what you're doing you have to understand you know good function and body good function to survive that kind of training and it it doesn't just have to be dance it can be anything it can be yoga pilates and so forth which are great modalities but if you do them in a way um you know that hurts your body and mostly we do that because we, we're not embodying what we're doing we have no clue what we're doing we're just imitating some kind of thing the teacher is showing us and uh, then you know that's when you're going to get injured so yeah it started with issues problems and then what can I do to fix this this was I think it's important for the honest to realize this was a long time ago so this was sorry to say 40 years ago and at that time there was no imagery imagery in sport was just starting somatics was just starting out um, this whole field you know even Pilates was just at the more at the beginning than it is now. Um, so it was a completely different environment and the resources were rare. So that's basically how it started and I can go on and on. And then uh, I really fell in love with using imagery and I think I can explain why later. Okay. <laughs> yes. I think it's just one of the safest and most obvious modalities around because um, there's a, lots of research and we have done research ourselves and it improves both movement and and psychological states and there's like reams of evidence on it i always say there's more research on imagery than on surgery <laughs> this actually so we know it works and i'm kind of sad sometimes why not more people use it because it's free it's always available can be adapted to any subgroup uh, can be uh, used for any kind of exercise system, sports system, and so forth. And it costs nothing and it's always available. Um, so I think everyone should learn, you know, the nuts and bolts of how to use it. It doesn't take much time. So that's Eric, one reason. When you say imagery, can you give an example, just because people might be actually thinking of it? Yes. It's, it's mental image is, is rather, you know, there's many different flavors. Um, but for example, one is imagine your head is a balloon and it's floating up and lengthening your spine. Imagine your shoulders are melting down like ice cream and, you know, just flowing down and taking all tension out of your system. Those are metaphorical images mm -hmm. and metaphors are really great. They're used in many exercise systems, Pilates, yoga, and so forth, and also sports. Um, they're great because they're easy to understand and people go, okay, I kind of got that. Now, another category is anatomical imagery. Mm -hmm. So in anatomical imagery, you're trying to visualize, feel your body exactly as it is to avoid problems. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, let, let's talk about forward head, you know, forward head. So you know, one instruction you're going to get is, okay, tuck your chin in, lengthen your neck and when you do that of course you've just replaced one form of tension with another form of tension <laughs> right and it doesn't seem to last very long either when people... and it won't last very long right yeah. so another solution is to embody the proper function in this area for example um, how does the head sit on top of the spine 
you know, show me the play. So when you teach, we like student-centered teaching. So that is not always telling people what to do. You know, people always, you know, are listening, do this, do that, do this, exercise, oh, you know, instead interview people, ask them. So where do you think the head sits on top of the spine? You know, and then people point to all kinds of places like this and you can see their embodiment of what they think that is. And then you say, well, in reality, it's a very balanced thing. So in humans, not in, you know, other earlier versions of us, um, the head is sort of like a seesaw on top of the top vertebrae. So very balanced. So let's find that fulcrum. The fulcrum is between your earlobes. So touch your earlobes, everyone. And then under the earlobes, there's a bone called the mastoid process. And now draw a horizontal line between these two points. And imagine that's the fulcrum of the seesaw of your head and just nod your head. And you can push up a little bit on these two points um you know getting a little more length and just a very easy seesawing motion so if a feather would fall on your nose it would be enough for your head to go like that and if a feather would fall on the back of your head it would be enough for you to go like that you do that a few times visualizing the proper location embodying the proper location of where your head sits on the spine and most people will feel oh yeah I've, my posture has improved already a little bit yeah and that's just the very beginning so that's an example of anatomical embodied process and imagery right to there. But um, a lot of people understand um, imagery under another notion. It's called motor imagery. And that is where you don't do a movement, but you imagine a movement you want to improve and try to do it perfectly. For example, I'm going to throw a spear, you know, all the way over there. I'm going to hit that dart into you know, that spot in the middle there, but I'm not gonna actually do it. I'm just gonna visualize that I'm doing that. And we know that works as well. So you can do imagery with movement, you could do it without movement, you can do it as metaphors, you can do it anatomically, and there's more flavors to that as well. So for example, you can see yourself from the outside doing something, you can see yourself from the inside doing something that's called perspective. The imagery can be outside your body, inside your body, and the, the goal can possibly be psychological. So it's also about improving mood, concentration, cognition, and many things like that. So basically using imagery also can improve, you know, your brain. And there's a few reasons for that. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, this is awesome class in imagery. I mean, I'm, I'm quite a geek for this stuff, but this is already, uh, you've really, really studied this stuff. I can see this is fantastic. So it's nice to geek out. Let's go back a little bit to the sort of Franklin method, all okay. the different parts of it then. So okay. was there sort of, was it an outgrowth of another system? Was it a combination of another of different systems? Tell us something about the genesis of it and maybe then the main constituents of it. Well, basically what I, what I did is uh, I went around and, and just tried out every somatic thing that was around. So um, you know, there was yoga, there was reflexology, there was adukinesis, uh, Bonnie Cohen was just starting out, you know, she was the beginning back then. And, you know, there were all the things, a little bit of Feldenkrais was there. And, um, you know, that's basically what was available and some other dance related um, types of movement, like no one's heard of it, probably, you know, Hawkins technique. And then there were imagery based methods, uh, improvisational methods, improvisation with imagery. And in dance, you use a lot of imagery. And this was all great. But um, when faced with a skeptical audience, and also with an audience that just, you know, okay, what can you do for me? Okay. That's mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, you have to do something practical. So you have to do something where they feel, you know, this is for me. This is not just some weird thing. This person wants to like, you know, the, the next thing, you know, that we're all supposed to be doing. Yeah. So I had to find out ways to start from, you know, to pick up the students from their interest level and go, okay, look, this actually can work for you. And a, a, an example of that, because one of the, I, I worked in sports and dance most in the beginning. So one of that, an example of that, if I come in to teach a group of dancers, I don't come in and say, you guys need to like learn anatomy and embody it. You know, they all go yawn and they leave, you know, right, yeah, <laughs> not okay. I say, okay, what do you want? Do you want, um, you know, they have a thing like you higher legs. Yeah, you want to keep your legs higher. Higher. 
or do you want to have better turnout, okay? okay, or stronger feet? So who votes? Okay, what do we start with higher legs, right? And then I give them, I just do a little process where they feel, wow, this really works, you know? And then I tell them afterwards, and you see, we did it by learning a little bit of anatomy and, and, and embodying it. And then they get interested and they want to know more. Right, right, right. Start we actually did a whole study on that. That's what they care about. So we, have a, we did a whole study on how imagery improves developer performance, kinematics, and mental imagery ability in university level band students. So we actually have a whole thing on that. So that's an example. Or I work, for example, uh, in gymnastics, and there it was the same thing. You're on the parallel bar, and you know, who, okay, usually it's like, okay, you know, stretch your foot a little more, you know, shoulder blade further down. And I started giving them imagery. So imagine, you know, your spine is a flexible rod of pearls or something. Uh, for someone who had difficulty, you know, with enough flexibility in their spine. And then afterwards they come back and say, that actually worked for me. I thought yeah. it was really weird when you told me, but it worked. I, don't know. I mean, I've, I've seen some research saying for athletic performance, it's best not always to sort of feel the body, particularly, you know, to focus on the body, particularly in a sort of strictly anatomical sense. So often yeah, well, that's, that's the whole discussion the about inner and outer focus. But um, the thing is, uh, there's no way you can improve movement without knowing what you're doing wrong. And that information comes from your proprioceptors. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna leave out proprioception, you're never gonna know if a movement is better or worse. I think outer focus is great for certain things that I mentioned before. For example, if I want to throw a dart into the center of a target, I'm definitely gonna use outer focus. You're not gonna focus on your elbow or something while throwing the exactly. dart. Exactly, I'm not gonna say my shoulder is relaxed or yeah. I'm yeah. using the right muscle. And that, that's a big misunderstanding. That's, that's not, <laughs> there's many examples of where you definitely wanna use outer focus. And you know, I, I know where that's coming from. And the example there, of course, is Oh, a surfing or not? Was it windsurfing? If I were windsurfing, I would not use inner focus. I would definitely look at the waves and the wind and things like that, right? So that is not a moment to use, you know, this kind of thing like that. But for example, well, critical, yeah, critical difference between where you would and wouldn't. So I mean, I'm with you on the proprioception. Like I, I recently, I've been weight training quite a lot. My right. my gym instructor was quite astonished at how quickly I corrected right. my move. And first of all, he was astonished that I was doing them mostly right in the first place because I could feel if there wasn't right. an alignment. You know, okay. why would I put 40 kilos for that? And the second thing he was astonished by was like, oh, when I give you an instruction, you, you, you're you able to do it. And that's because like, you're embodied. I know where, that's because yeah, you're yeah, like I know where, But that was, that, he said, that was weird. Yeah. <laughs> I was well, like, well, what? that's but, yeah, because you can feel what your coach is talking about, right? Yeah, so I can see now, the correction for sure. It's, so I, I, I worked with, with at the U.S. weightlifting in Colorado Springs. Okay, those are the basically uh, people that will end up at the Olympics. And there's a very extreme there. And, and their main thing is, I do not want to get injured because <laughs> that's right. the end. And so, for example, there, it was all about the sacroiliac joint, how to use that joint in a balanced fashion to not wreck your lower back when you're lifting these weights. And there is no way to balance the sacroiliac joint with an outer focus that's going to be really hard to do, to find yeah. an image yeah. that's going to do that. So I think that in many instances, outer focus is great, but there are certain ones where you want to be really specific about a joint or a muscle or a fascia. Um, you're going to have to have some internal focus as well. And even bodybuilders, what they often do is they they touch the muscle they're working on so they can feel it. Better. Muscle connection. Yeah. So yeah, if you can't feel the muscle that you're training, you're probably not training it. They say. Yeah, yeah. The bodybuilders. If you can't feel the muscle you're them. training. You know, you're probably, and we know that just focusing on a muscle actually increases its tone, activates it more. So yeah. I think there's a place for both external and internal focus, but especially in dance, external focus. Sorry, dancing is the ability to sense your body expressing beauty, feeling beauty, telling a story with your body. How are you going to do that ex only with outer focus? It's not possible. Yeah, you most dancers I've met are pretty dissociated. And, it, and, and there is a difference between men and choose to move skillfully between the two, right? Exactly. Well. So, for example, you could have inner focus or one movement, and then you want to do a pirouette, and there yeah. I would recommend outer focus, for example, you know, 
with spotting there's something called spotting yeah um, but but the thing is also to to try different things so if you have a student or a client give them an outer focus an inner focus and see what works there's no argument if the inner focus works better use that if the outer fo focus works better use that so i i usually present a smorgasbord of things so people can try and try and then i say what do you like what are the other things, because uh, uh, we've talked a lot about imagery already, which is great, but what are the other things that are part of the Franklin Method? Um, well, part of the Franklin Method is, of course, embodied anatomy. And we've talked about that a little bit. So what is uh, anatomy versus embodied anatomy? So I've gone to many schools to teach movement people that have had anatomy, and I've noticed it didn't transfer into movement. It's like not really helping them to move better because it's not right. embodied. Uh, one classic example is uh, dancers have a lot of knee injuries and lower back injuries. And in lower back injuries, for example, we know um, that is more prevalent in people that can't disassociate their femur, their leg bone from their pelvic bone. So the way you would do this is you would say, okay, everyone, um, Take your fingers and put them in the air and touch your hip joints. Let's see where our embodiment is for our hip joints. And a lot of people will touch out there or touch yeah. their colon or touch somewhere. So they're not embodying where the joint is. And if you don't know where a joint is, it's going to be hard to move correctly from that joint or do yeah. what yeah. you call in dance a bottom all. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. what you're going to do, you're going to use your pelvis instead. You're going to twist your supporting leg, your supporting knee is gonna twist. And that is also why you have a prevalence of uh, knee injuries and lower back issues in dance. And so we help them, okay, here it is, into the middle of this crease, start moving from your hip joint. Then you show them the location. So you say, look, this is the proof, this is a femur. And if you put a femur on your leg, you can see exactly, aha, uh -huh, okay, this is where the hip joint is located. And then you could show it to them from their perspective like that. You see, so they really feel it there in the hip joint. And, you know, one another big thing is dancers. And in general, there's a lot of interest in that um, general population have a lot of anterior hip pain. And that goes right into this department. So another thing we talk about in the Franklin Method is evolution. So if you look at the hip joint from an evolutionary perspective, Mm -hmm. When we were quadrupeds, we had right. much better coverage of the socket over the femur head. And now, if you come up like this, you'll see in our posture, the coverage is much worse. Yes. So you have much worse coverage. You add to that a lot of the cues people get, sorry, in many exercise systems, they're still getting them, like tuck your pelvis, you know, pull your belly button in, that's going to move the pelvis posture like that get even worse coverage and now you have the femur head pushing against the front of the socket and hurting this labrum here so you want to embody the femur head pushing up and back in the socket for example in a variety of movements and then we slowly practice that you bounce on the femur heads we call that and we try to really feel the femur head pushing properly into the socket Another principle of the Franklin method. So it's student centered. We try to develop things with the student. We don't tell them, okay, this is where the hip joint is. Is that clear? Then everyone nods, but I can tell you it's not clear. Yeah, yeah, they're their own it. right. it's kind it's like not clear. Idea. So you have to ask them, where do you think it is? Okay, let's try to visualize that. Let's try to feel that practice with it. Why would that be a good idea? Uh, well, it improves function. You're going to have more flexibility. Your back will be happier. You're going to save your labrum, things like that. And yep. then we talk a lot about evolution. So, you know, the, your body was designed for certain functions. Sadly, it wasn't designed for many of the exercise systems that we have today. And that doesn't mean they're bad. The body was designed primarily for walking, running. We all know that climbing, maybe throwing, carrying, digging, things like that. So we have to look at the body from that perspective. It's all designed, you know, mostly for efficient walking. And a lot of people have to have learned about exercise. They learn it from a lens, through a lens of an exercise system. For example, through the lens of yoga, through the lens of Pilates, through the lens of all the other things that are out there. And I've discovered that can be confusing. 
And I think it's that's great to have <laughs> saying it, Eric. That's a very polite, that's a very polite way of saying it. Yes, you know, and that can be confusing, right? And then you have ideas that sound anatomical that are actually not anatomical at all. And one, for example, is in you know, in dance and, and, and also other systems, like they are not mentioning anything, you know, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's when you rotate like that, and there's money exercise, we rotate, you're supposed to lengthen your spine, right? Mm -hmm. The truth is the spine shortens a little bit when uh, you rotate your spine and yeah. um, to protect something very important, which is the spinal cord. So here's the spinal cord, which is in the spine and it's made of millions of nerves and when the spine rotates, the last thing you want is these nerves to be rotated and lengthened. That's how you tear something apart. So <laughs> what the spine does is it, you know, it, it's structure, and we don't want to get into it right now, but because of the structure of the joints and the ligaments and the discs and so forth, right? The spine shortens a little bit to protect the spinal cord. Another example of that, you know, shoulder blades should go down and in, you know, that's another so-called cue. But when you lift your arms, the shoulder blades have to go out. So if you have the idea in your head that they should go down and in, you have a conflict between your function and your idea in your head. Yeah. And that creates tension. Tension is an argument with your function. So that's another thing we address. And there's many more examples, like lift your kneecaps was a thing you get told. And then, of course, when you bend your knees, the kneecaps have to go down. And then that's why you're going to create more compression. And create... So we talk a lot about, OK, cueing. What is sensible cueing? What are some cues that are fantasy, that are just you know hearsay? Uh, and what, what, what is the actual anatomy? So we work a lot on clarifying that as well. So embodied anatomy, using imagery to improve movement and psychological states talking about evolution, talking about what the body was actually structured to do, and then trying to teach our exercise system that we've learned, whatever it is, through that lens, so we don't get injured. I mean, another example is there were two articles in the New York Times about hip injuries in, in, uh, from yoga. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean yoga is bad, it just means you've, uh, the way you, 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 you're doing your yoga is not functional and you're gonna you're gonna hurt your hip and an, another thing of course is talking about the relationship between mood and movement okay yeah tell me about that <laughs> okay so one one exercise you can do so you know if you're listening to this or watching one exercise you can do goes like this so posture everyone slouch like this everyone slouch like really slouch and they and now say, I feel great. I feel wonderful. I feel yeah. so good, right? And you know, this is a mismatch. It, you don't say that thing, you know, in this posture. Then take your arms up like this, stretch them up like that, and say, I feel awful. I feel <laughs> awful. <laughs> That's <laughs> another sense. mismatch. No, if you're like this, you don't feel awful, right? So it's a mismatch. And so if, if I go like this, I call, you know, if you go like this, like that, even if you're, not in a good mood previously. If you go like this, just for a few moments, shake your arms like this, if you're cheerleading or cheerleading for yourself, you go like that for a moment. And then afterwards you go, oh yeah, not so bad. It's not so bad today. You know, like things, <laughs> things are okay. <laughs> yeah, I feel like as, as embodiment practitioners, we have these tools that are so at hand, like posture and breath and movement and can shift things so quickly. And it almost feels like cheating at being a human, you know? Exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, I was the fastest way to change your movement is to change your mind about the movement. So um, <laughs> let's just try this. So we comparing mood and motivational imagery with just like, you know, general uh, instructional image. So if you if you take your arms up like that, let's try two versions. Yeah. So everyone, please uh, imagine your arms are floating up like a balloon or there's a wind blowing from behind us and just blowing the arms up like that. And you just love doing this. You know, my favorite move is to lift my arms and notice how that feels. Version number one. Version number two, I'm really exhausted today and I'm kind of bored and uh, my arms feel like really heavy and tired and I don't really want to do this. So 
well, I'll do it anyway, just because this presenter wants me to lift my arms. So everyone, please lift your heavy, exhausted arms. Exactly. And now most people will notice the difference. So yeah, yeah, yeah. your body is follow is following what you're thinking. Which is one for you. Imagine, imagine you've just some, someone's pointing a gun at you and you've had to put your arms up to surrender. That's going to be different we, again, right? Now we, it's going to feel now we come to different. Exactly. But now the interesting point is, okay, so, you know, every day we go around and say, how are you doing today? Or, you know, how are you? We say that and you should get the answer, you know, fine. Okay. Um, you know, I'm hanging on or whatever. Yeah, busy. But yeah. if people have a specific issue with their body, they'll off, off, um, they often they will be very, you know, specific and, and, and they'll say a lot about it. Yeah. You know, I don't know what it is. I have this pain here and I've, you know, yeah, yeah. the PT and it keeps hurting and if I shift over here, it hurts as well. And, you know, and they go on and on like that and go, I'm so sorry, you know, like that's really bad. And, you know, acknowledge and try to support you. But hardly ever, you know, do we say, hi, how are you doing today? So uh, what Mark asked me, how are you doing today, Eric? How are you doing, Eric? Well, today I woke up and I just felt my spine was so free and flexible. My head was floating up like a balloon and my diaphragm was free and my breathing was just so comfortable. I was just enjoying breathing. And when I walked, it just felt so soft and, you know, perfect. You're going to think this guy's nuts. <laughs> Very rarely does anyone, you know, spontaneously say something really yeah, positive, like. Yeah, or even just give a detailed off. description. You know, even if it was negative, it would be like something like, you know, no one says, oh, I'm holding a lot of tension in my right trapezius and I'm, you know, my jaws kind of tight and my eyes feel sleepy. You know, even that level of specificity would be unusual, right? So it's not but just, it it's would be normal. unusual. No, but the, the, what I'm saying is they wouldn't come and say, okay, today my jaw is really relaxed. Oh, I see. They're not going to come in and tell you that. They wouldn't. You yeah. do not really hear that. It comes you with a problem. No, you know. And, and then, you know, sometimes, you know, when we do back workshops, right? So works through the back. So people are like, you know, what is your goal for your back? And then, you know, say, okay, my goal for the back is, um, you know, I want to be free of pain. And we go, okay, that's a good starting point. But, you know, we, that's a blue elephant. You know, a blue elephant is if you want to, so if you want to be free of pain, what are you focusing on? What is your brain thinking about pain, right? Yeah. So what's the opposite of pain? Free movement, uh, pleasure, uh, what Ease. Exactly. So you ask them, you ask the audience, so your goal is, is comfort and pleasure in your spine. Everyone say that out loud. I want to have a comfortable, pleasurable spine. And people get uncomfortable saying that. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's yeah. like, it's like, I, I, I want to have pleasure in my spine. Yes, I, I want to have, but you know, right now I have. <laughs> it's like the best people can hope for is a lack of pain right like this 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 normal and this painful and normal is sort of just a lack of pain that's that's exactly. the sort of normal assumption i would say yeah but i mean the thing is let's face it people are chasing up after this elusive thing of feeling good and and usually try trying to achieve it with outer means you know if i if i buy if i have that or if if that person would like me or if this relationship would work out yeah. i'll be happy but you're you're like you're basically you're down to your life experience is how does my body feel right now and how do my thoughts feel right now how are my thoughts everything points that way right whether it's the lamborghini making you feel good or the bank account making you feel good or the status or whatever it's all still coming back to how do you actually feel exactly and so if if you're not embodying feeling comfortable um or it just your body doesn't feel good you can have all the lamborghinis and it's still not fun and the thing is you can you can incrementally teach that so it's something called the four steps in the franco method so i don't come in and say i'm teaching positive thinking i don't teach positive thinking <laughs> it's like if someone is pain and and i tell them you should you should you should say i feel great and i go but i don't feel great yeah no i've tried that, <laughs> doesn't that, work. that with my ukrainian friends right now they would uh they tell exactly you that. they would like yeah. so but what you can do okay status quo is you know, I'm depressed, I feel bad, my body feels I'm exhausted, you know, and, and like that's that starting point. And then we go, okay, but what is our goal? We all we have, have to have a goal. So the goal is, you know, peace, comfort in my body, uh, I, my goals are back, I can see where I'm going. And then, of course, the third is how to achieve that, you know, how can I get there? And, uh, you know, 
it's a huge thing. So why don't we start with something really small? So we're going to start today with just feeling a little better in our neck, for example, just as a little piece of our whole life experience, right? So, you know, just to give them a little that. So everyone put your hands on your neck like that, and then squeeze your neck a little bit with your hands like this. Or just squeeze your hands as if you're squeezing a sponge. So the image is squeezing a sponge. Move your head a little forward and back, or you know, sideways, or rotate your head, whatever you feel like doing, like that, sideways, rotation, up and down. Good. Then take your hand away and then notice, does your neck feel just a little bit, you know, better like that? So that little aspect of your life, neck feels a little bit better. So at least there, we, you know, so you go like that. So little, little things like that or shoulders. This is, this is an exercise that's everyone's favorite. Shoulders are good. Let's do shoulders and okay. some sciatic pain. Okay. So that would be a good example as well at some point. Okay, good. So the next thing you, so, so we have the four steps. So the four steps are, where am I at? What do I want? What are the tools that are really available to me? and then act on the tools. And as I said, imagery tools and proprioceptive tools are always available for you. So imagery is mind-body and proprioception is a body-mind tool. So the next punching is a body-mind tool because you, you did something you know, with your hands to the body and your brain notices, oh, I feel more comfortable. So that's a body-mind tool. Should we do shoulders? I think lots of people have stiff shoulders. Okay, okay, okay. Do, 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 okay. okay. shoulders, very simple. So you take your very similar principle. You take a hand, put it on your shoulder, but the thumb is touching the neck. Then you're going to squeeze the shoulders if you're squeezing a sponge. Then you're going to roll the shoulder. And when the shoulder is at the top, you squeeze. And when it comes down, you let go. Good. And then let's go in the other direction like that and squeeze and let go. And now shake your arm a little bit and lean to the side. So I'm shaking like that, the arm a little bit, tap your arm, give your arm a nice tap like that. Just we're tapping our arm all the way from the shoulder, fingertip, shake your arm a little bit, just like do a very, you know, fun shake. And then just compare the sides for a moment, compare the, the shoulder, anyone feel a difference? Lift your arms, you feel a difference in flexibility between the two sides, right? So now we've achieved a little more fun for our life in this shoulder. My left arm, my left arm is more fun than the right. <laughs> exactly. Right now, my left, in fact, the arm is more a more fun part of my existence than we do the other side. So you roll your shoulder, you squeeze. And now, of course, you can you use you're using mind body. So imagining uh, it's a sponge you're squeezing, you're speaking, squeezing water out of the sponge. But you're also using body mind because you're touching your body and sending proprioceptive signals up to your brain, which can then use those signals to improve your movement. Then we're going to shake our arm a little bit, shake a little bit. Very good. Then uh, tap your arm, tap all around, and shake your arms like that. So I've done this with a lot of sports teams as well. Um, and because if you shake and you tap, well, first of all, you notice now probably even the spine is a little more lengthened. Yeah. Yeah. Spine is a little more lengthened, shoulders more dropped. So a lot of athletes before they, you know, do their thing, whatever their competition is, they tap like, like sprinters will tap their legs yeah, 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 yeah. and swimmers will, will shake like that, you know, before they jump in the water, no one stretches. You don't stretch before, you know, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Because, uh, it reduces uh, reaction speed of the muscle. But you do shake, you tap, you do things like that. You're just going to get more in their bodies and uh, more body aware. Is that the, well, it, 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 just, it, 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 it revs up the muscles and improves the tone of the muscles and improves performance. But if you think about it in daily life, what an easy thing this would be to do, just to tap and to shake you know, if you just shake your arms for a moment like that, and you know, you just shake. Yeah, I've been tapping quite a lot just on my body, rub my face. 
you know, I do a little bit of self massage. I do that quite a lot. And Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So, so these, funny, but... these are starter exercises. So people see, wow, it's not that hard to feel better in my body. Because yeah. you come with super complicated things like, look, you have to do this exercise now, stretch that arm this way, and then here, touch there, and then do like, you know. Well, you could teach someone how to do that in five minutes, even if they're <laughs> like, like, not an embodiment person, they could get that, what you just showed. I'm going to be very selfish now. I don't suppose you've got anything good for sciatic pain. I, I grew my glutes too quickly and trapped my nerve underneath my piriformis. Any good uh, sciatica, sciatica type ones? Yeah, well, okay. But I would also like to, let's do something for that. And then afterwards, let's do uh, something for breathing. Okay. This nice little Perfect. breathing process, breathing which is going to be good for for the stressful situation you know we're in right now <laughs> in the, on the planet, right? So the first thing I would do in that case, I would show the audience, and I'm you know not really fully equipped for everything right now, but I'll do my very best. I'll show the audience where the piriformis muscle is located. So the piriformis muscle attaches here to the sacrum and it goes over there to the femur. So first I'll show this right here, one second. So it goes like this from the sacrum, from the front of the sacrum, attaches broadly to the front of the sacrum, goes over to the femur. Let's look at this model here, it's a little more involved. So there we have, the piriform is right there. See, it's a huge muscle like that. And let's see, we have, yes, we do. So on this side here, I don't know if you can see it. So we're looking at a model of the piriformis. And then here you can see the sciatic nerve. Great. So for, the, for listeners on uh, the podcast rather than YouTube, make sure you go to YouTube. <laughs> exactly. There's a little model here and he's showing the sciatic nerve right underneath the piriformis muscle. Exactly. So we're going to release tension here in the piriformis. We're going to use a simple exercise to do that. Maybe add a little stretch afterwards, although we really, it's more about releasing the tension right through here and balancing this nerve. So what we think have to know about nerves, we never think about it, but nerves also move when we move. So they have to, they have to slide a little bit. So nerves are not straight the way that you see them in books, but they're like wavy, extremely wavy like this. So they run in waves so they can lengthen nicely. And they're surrounded by fascia. However, what they really don't like is compression. So we want to release some of that. So the way to do it is, I'm just quickly fetch my skeleton here. So you want to find this part of the femur, which is the greater trochanter. And then, yeah. and I'm going to show you how to find it in a moment. And then you want to put your fingers behind the greater trochanter at the top of, behind there, because that's where the tendon of the piriformis attaches to this bone. So it would be right about there. And then we're going to rub there while we do leg movement. So just adjust my camera a little bit so those who are going to watch this can see it. So you're going to go up the side of the leg there until you feel like something hard. And that's gonna be the greater trochanter. Yep. So you find that, so up there, and then you feel that, okay? There at the side. So don't go around here like that, just go up the side of the leg, and then it's usually easy to find. It's not the iliac crest, so it's not this here. Don't get it confused with that, that's much higher up. Then you put your, Weight on the other leg, so not at the side you're touching, so you're behind there. And then you're gonna rub behind there, and I'm gonna do it with my thumb. You could also do it with a ball or something. I'm gonna rub behind there and turn my leg in and out, like that. And it, it, it will probably hurt a little bit. Does that hurt? Yeah, it's a- Tinder, yeah. So really try to find that. And if you go a little bit towards the sacrum and keep rubbing there, you might feel the muscle bulging as you turn your leg in and out. So I'm turning my leg in and out, you see, in and out, and I'm rubbing there. And that's the piriformis <laughs> that you're releasing right through there. And then the next thing you want to do, and now I'll turn the camera down here a little bit to the chair. Hope you can see this. Move this all forward a little bit get the sponge out of the way. 
And you can put your leg on the chair like that, on the same leg of the same side, right? Good. Show it from the other side like that. And then you just tap right to there. That whole area you just touched, you're gonna to tap it a little bit. You can do it with your fist or you can do it with a ball. You're gonna tap that, lift the leg, tap a little bit. Good. And then finish up with just like a little gentle squeezing of the gluteus all around here. Just a nice little squeeze of the gluteus. All right. Good. Squeeze and tap. And then we're going to compare sides for a moment. See if you feel a difference between the sides. So first, lift your leg on the side. We just practice. So lift your leg. Notice what that feels like. Notice how free your hip is and uh, compare to the other side. Maybe also swing your leg forward. How does that feel on the side you practice compared to the other side? And some of you feel the hamstrings are you know, tighter on the side you didn't practice yet, the hip is tighter. And now very interestingly, if you stand on the leg you just practiced, you'll probably notice that you're more balanced on that side. Somehow your pelvis is more lifted and the other side you feel like less balanced. Yeah, yeah, definitely balance difference. And now, now exactly more balance. And now do a hop on the side you practiced. And now do a hop on the side you didn't practice. And you probably feel on the side you didn't practice like more heavier and stiffer, you know, and not as comfortable. So let's do the other side. Find the trochanter. Find the trochanter. Rub behind the trochanter. So this is just a very easy daily thing you can do to release the piriformis and take tension off that sciatic nerve, so you're going to rub behind the greater trochanter, turn the leg in and out, try to find that muscle, give it a good rub. Very good. That's right. Breathe, of course. Exactly. Then give it a nice tap. Good. Very good. Squeeze. Then we're gonna do a little, our little stretch there on the chair. Of course, you could have your leg much higher up. So, and then I tap a little bit on that side and go forward a little bit. Very good. Then tap both sides to balance out. Notice pelvic posture. <laughs> Let's add one more exercise right on to that to release lower back tension. Okay. Good. So very simple exercise because you know lower back and legs are very connected here. You have the thracolumbar fascia, which connects the lower back to the sacrum and the fascia of the legs. So first we're just gonna feel our lower back. So move your lower back a little bit. What does it feel like? So move to the right, left. Just notice, is it comfortable or tight? And then number two, our goal is for the back just to feel a little freer, more comfortable and released. Then you're gonna take your knuckles, the knuckles of your hand like that, and we're gonna actually put them on our lower back and move the knuckles back and forth like this. And they're gonna move our pelvis in opposition to that. So you can really rub back there. Nice warmth, very good. <laughs> Excellent, back and forth, nice and fast. And then we can go up and down as well, like that, up and down. You can even do that with a little bounce if you want. Yeah, a little bounce, good, excellent. And then just notice your lower back, move your lower back. Does it feel a little more lengthened? Does it feel freer, more comfortable? Maybe take a few steps. Good. So let's do two more things. We have time for two more little things. Uh, yeah, we can. We got ten minutes. Okay. Well, maybe we'll, one. Maybe one. Okay. Well, the, the, they're There's very time. fast. They're they're not going to take much time. So three or four mm -hmm. minutes each. So if you're sitting on a chair listening to this, do the following. Okay. Um, stand up and sit down which is, by the way, great exercise for your brain <laughs> because uh, by doing standing up and sitting down, you're fluctuating very subtly the blood pressure, the blood flow to the brain. 
and that stimulates the capillaries in a way that the endothelium, endothelium gets uh, the inner layer of the capillaries and the vessels get more regenerated. We could help regenerate uh, the brain vessels. So standing up and sitting down is very helpful. But what we're going to do is we're going to put our hands in our armpits while we do that. And imagine our shoulders are melting down onto our hands. It's not really happening because that wouldn't be fun, but just standing up and sitting down. Standing up and sitting down, good. Just imagine your shoulders dropping down at your hands. Then go for a walk with your hands in your armpits or go jogging for a moment with your hands in your armpits, exactly. Good, then take your hands away and notice your posture. You probably feel that your spine is more lengthened, your shoulders more dropped. And just also notice how that's affecting your mind. The fact that you're, you're more lengthened in your spine and your shoulders more dropped. So just last thing we're gonna do is for the most important muscle of breathing. Breathing has been a, quite of an issue the last two years, right? Yeah. So major issue. So it's always good to do things for breathing. And the most important muscle of ventilation. So the first step in breathing is to get the oxygen in the body. And that happens because the diaphragm, the muscle right here, goes down and expands the lung together with the ribs. So let's find the diaphragm in our body. It attaches to the bottom of the sternum, the bottom of this bone here at the front. It attaches to the lowest six ribs and attaches to the lumbar spine. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. So if, uh, you know, if your bicep stops working, it's not so comfortable. You can't bend your elbow as well. Uh, you know, glutes like, or if you have tight fascia, it's uncomfortable. If your diaphragm stops working, you're gone within minutes. Yeah. So it's kind of the most important muscle to maybe do something for every day. But, you know, it's not just telling people, okay, now let's breathe freely, breathe comfortably. I mean, what does that mean for the average person that's like, I don't know, I think I'm doing that, right? So we have to create that feeling. And what we're going to do is the first thing we're going to tap the general area the diaphragm is located. So just give it a little bit of a tap. And then we're gonna do that exercise we did before that we know has an effect. So if you shake your arm, which is gonna wiggle all the muscles around the bones, just a little bit of a shake and the arm is already freer. So if you compare, you know, that'll free up your arms. So now we're gonna do the same thing for our diaphragm. So what we're going to do, everyone who's listening here, <laughs> is we're going to move our rib cage back and forth rapidly and make a sound, which will help us hear the state of our diaphragm. So we're going to go, oh, let's make a sound. Very good. Oh, and now the next exercise is we're going to imagine the diaphragm, which is this dome-like shape, to be a trampoline bouncing up and down. So a trampoline. So bounce up and down and just bounce your diaphragm and you make a sound like this. And shake again. Bounce up and down. Very good. Then just stand here for a moment and just for a moment, just feel your body and no thinking, you know, we're, we do plenty of that. So just stand here and feel. And notice, do you feel just a little more comfortable? Is it just a little more fun to be in your body? <laughs> it you is. Know? And is that today, Eric? Thank you. It's just that you know that's the whole thing. If you can make it more fun to be in a body, that's good because the news is there's no replacement body waiting for you. So that's that. This is it, you know. And and I always say so because I have a lot of movement teachers asking so. What would be more valuable, you think, in general? So just giving your client another exercise or showing them how to be just comfortable in their body. I like being in my body and that ties into body schema, body image. So people are not comfortable being in their body. 
or they had traumatic experiences, you know, and things like that. So being more comfortable in your body is kind of an asset. Yeah. Wonderful. Eric, that's, that's pretty, I love this frame of having, you know, it being fun to be in your body, not like it should, you should be in your body. Exactly. Or, or you body. should be to be fit like this or fit like that, or, you know, like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll only be liked if I have this asset in my body. It's like so stressful. It's what about just feeling good in my body, you know? So many people focusing on sort of exercise, but not necessarily actually even enjoying their bodies. You know? Exactly. People, there's a lot of people that are very fit to do a lot of things, but they're not really having fun in their body. I, I'd see in the gym, there's half the <laughs> people who look like they're enjoying it and half who really don't. I'm like, why exactly. do you yeah. half, like that, half, you know? half do and half don't, exactly. And, and how have you found this whole sort of online movement? I mean, the last few years, like me, you've been, you know, teaching online in a big way. I mean, exactly. how's it been for you? Well, it's very interesting because before this all started, I was like a little bit, I wouldn't say a burnout, but I was traveling constantly, nonstop, here and there and everywhere. And I was just getting, like, I'm more than half a year I was on the road. I was thinking, I'm not going to be able to do that forever. And so on a level when this happened, well, the first, the first phase, it was just like, what are we going to do now? You know, every conference canceled and every event canceled. And like, yeah. first it was a bit of freak out, but um, I was already practiced with online because I had been doing online courses. So we started right. this uh, free, you know, webinar series and we did a, you know, how to breathe better and, you know, have healthy lungs through embodiment. And that was very popular. And then we started doing more stuff like that online. And the audience, a large part of our audience is, is you know, German and Swiss and Austrian who were not used to at all online. First, they kind of resisted a little, but then they got like used to that's actually pretty good. I can, when the class is over, I'm, I'm already at home. So that's pretty nice. <laughs> nice, isn't it? This is the Ukraine, the first time I've been exactly. for a while for work. It's, it's pretty, oh. it's pretty, uh, it's, yeah. It, it just because just I'm in, in Ukraine tomorrow, any thoughts on trauma or stress or anything of, of that nature? Well, I, I would, I would highly recommend, you know, uh, the thing is the mind can really torture us. And, and I've had my, share of trauma in the last few years believe me i don't want to talk about it right now but serious stuff so what really helps is you know trying to sit down i'm going to meditate now which is great or i'm going to stop my thinking it's sometimes really hard so yeah. what we just did for example the diaphragm shake the diaphragm tap you know just like free up that diaphragm free your breathing um get the tension out of your shoulder and neck can work magic because it's, you know, trapezius sternocleido, they're innervated by, um, uh, you know, a cranial nerve. And so where they're very related to our sense of self, sense of balance, sense of gait. So if you can release those, we'll do something for the sternocleido next time. Um, then it just like really helps. And, back and things like that. Okay. So those take, do those, just go hide in a cupboard and shake your diaphragm. You <laughs> I can do it with, the, with my team. Okay. It's no problem. We can do it together. Listen, I've got a Polish driver outside waiting for me. I want to make sure okay. I grab it. So where okay. do people find you, Eric, on the internet? Where's the best place to go? Uh, well, you can come to our website, you know, frankenmethod.com. That's a good, we have also a YouTube channel. We're on, we're on Instagram, Facebook, and all those things. But yeah, just come and sign up for some of our free online stuff. And we actually have something for you. We have a, a Fit and Healthy with Imagery um, webinar workshop that's free. If you were here, you can sign up for that. And also a bunch of other videos. For you. Excuse me? Do people need a code or anything for that? Do we need a code or anything? We just go to franklin, that's F-R-A-N-K-L-I-N method.com, right? Right. You, or, yeah, exactly. Or two, you can write us at info at franklinmethod.com. But uh, let me just quickly check if there's any information on that um, that I missed here. Um, oh, yeah. I have a link here. Is there a way I can, shall I send? The link is franklinmethod.com um, slash embodiment podcast. Slash embodiment podcast? Because the people yeah, are in between, yeah. Exactly. Okay, but I'm sure if they they message you, if they if they can't get get that, they can always message you and uh, exactly yeah. info at info at franklinmethod.com. Exactly. Okay. All right. Eric, closing message about the body. 
Uh, it's the only one you got. So work every day to uh, enjoy how it feels and improve its function. Because I don't believe, you know, especially the whole topic of aging, the more you age, the more you need to work on your efficiency. You know, the whole thing about that you're going to, you know, wear, uh, you know, wear out your body through movement is not true. You wear your body and by using it, you repair it. So movement is repair. If you want to repair the tissues, you got to move. Boom. Thank you, Eric. My pleasure. Thank you very much and good luck with everything. <laughs>